Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone who's joining us today. Uh, my name is Duncan. I'm a curator at Singapore Art Museum, and I'm pleased to welcome everyone to tonight's online event, uh, Putting Myself on Screen, a uh, desktop performance and lecture by the artist Maya Man. This is the fourth episode in Sam's Skill Future series, a digital commissioning platform that consists of performances, workshops, and lectures that elaborate on advances of intelligence. Uh, issuing from minor histories and inviting artistic practices to consider the screen as a speculative medium of the future. I hope these ideas interest you as much as they do us, so do look out for upcoming programs as part of this series. I also want to thank my colleagues Anissa, Shahida, and Rose, and everyone else at SAM who helps make Skill Futures possible. Uh, we're joined tonight by Maya Mann, an American artist whose work considers the computer screen as a space for intimacy and performance. Focusing on the phenomenon of translating our offline selves into online content. Maya holds Bachelor of Arts degrees in Computer Science and Media Studies from Pomona College, and she's currently pursuing an MFA in Media Art at UCLA in Los Angeles. You can find her online at Maya on the Internet. Uh, we're lucky to be hosting a three part program with Maya today, which will consist of two related performances and a lecture unpacking her ideas regarding the performance of self via online platforms through the lens of performance and media theory and in the context of her own artistic practice. Uh, just a reminder that uh, we'll have a QA and a conversation after Maya's presentation and anyone can weigh in using the Q&A function in the webinar. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Maya to start her program. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm going to get started and share my screen. Okay. So now we should all be on the same page. Um, I wanted to start today. It's kind of tonight for me. But I wanted to start by creating a collage here on my desktop. Um, this is the screen that I'm looking at all day, all the time when I'm making my work. And so I think it's nice that within this format, you all can look at it too. The window I have up here is my personal website, mayaontheinter.net. Um, and I'm gonna start opening some windows, um, placing them around the screen. Uh, this one is glance back. Um, <laughs> it's a browser extension, uh, takes a photo of me once a day at random. Um, I kind of, yeah, I kind of at first thought I would cleanse the photos before I did this presentation, but these are actually the ones I took today. And truly today I was thinking about Singapore. So I'll leave that there. Um, open up this one. This is actually documentation of a project that I did this past year. Uh, pull it up here. Yeah, I'm gonna leave that there. Okay. There's something very soothing about collaging windows on the screen. <laughs> it's what I'm always doing because I feel like I have a million tabs open all the time. Um, so this feels like sort of a natural way of working. Um, if I pull a window up though, I kind of like to refresh it, um, make sure that it's gonna be as responsive as possible. This one here. Um, what is that here? What's nice about starting with my website is that it links to most of the projects that are out there that anyone can see. Um, and it's kind of how now most people move through the internet. Very rarely do you see someone actually type in a URL. Um, I think for this one, I'm gonna put this up here. 
We don't need this one. So keep this here. Okay. And what's the glasses? There's always something very vulnerable about seeing um, seeing someone else's social media, even just the UI around it, knowing that they're logged into their own account. Uh, there's something invasive about it. It's here. So I have another piece actually that is not on my website yet. I want to share. Up there. <laughs> okay. It's very hard to coordinate these so you can see all of them clearly running at once. There we go. Oops, what's that? Okay. Bring this to the front. There's actually one more piece I want to bring up here that is not on the internet yet. Um, so all of these pieces right now, except technically for glance back, uh, all of these pieces right now are online. So you could go to your browser and visit any of these URLs and see them running live. But this one, uh, this one is not yet online um i keep all of my projects ongoing in a development folder um it's kind of where i just organize all of my code uh, I'm gonna pull this one up So hard to make them all visible at once. Let's go there. <laughs> this is like my own personal version of Times Square, my work. All right, I think this is everything. Um, this is a lot to look at. It's a lot to take in at once. I'm gonna close this. Um, yeah, this is it. Um, thank you all for watching me build this collage. I'm going to save your eyes for a second and stop screen recording. Um, because it's a little bit chaotic. So one second. Okay. Um, Maybe your desktop looks like that all the time. Mine kind of always does look like that. What's interesting about these Zoom recordings or Zoom 
sessions is I always feel like it's really strange if I gave a talk in an offline physical space situation, I can't see myself. And it's always really strange for me to be able to sort of watch myself as I'm talking to you all, not be able to see you at all and only be able to see me. Um, it's always, it's always felt really weird. Um, so I thought that um, would be nice to sort of put myself in your position a little bit uh, and feel out what it's like to uh, watch my own performance. Because as an artist, I think it's so important to be able to see outside of yourself and have a sense of being able to critique yourself well uh, and kind of give your own feedback on what you're doing. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen again, actually. Um, oh wait, one crucial detail. Okay, cool. So let me start this video. <clears throat> Hi everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming to this lecture today. Um, it, uh, it was totally new for me to do that kind of format where I'm screen sharing and I'm putting all of the windows together in a collage, um, but it felt really right because I wanted to do something that felt native to the format of the session today. Um, but I really appreciate you being here um, and I thought it would be fun to do a little playback of uh, the performance, unpack it a little bit, give you a little bit of a behind the scenes look uh, into my process uh, and just a little bit more detail as to what went into everything that I was showing. Um, so I have uh, the video here. I hope you can see it okay. Um, I'm just gonna start it going here. Hi everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, okay, already it's a little bit, it was a little bit awkward at the start. Honestly, I never know how to start these things and make them feel casual in a way. And I can't hear anyone else talking. So listening to it back, it seems a little bit weird, but I hope you all feel okay. Um, I'm gonna get started and share my screen. Okay. Cool. okay. So now we should all be on the same page. Um, I wanted to start, it's kind of weird because I, now I'm looking into my webcam, but when I was recording this video, I was doing it on my monitor because I wanted a larger space for the collage. Um, but the, the eye contact is a little, is a little off, which feels a little Today, strange. it's kind of tonight for me, but I wanted to start by creating a collage here. It's three. It's it's three forty five in the morning for me. My desktop. Um, this is the screen that I'm looking at all day, all the time when I'm making my work, and so I think it's nice that within this format you all can look at it too. The window I have up here. Seeing the mouse moving is very ghost in the machine feeling. Here is my personal website, MayaOnTheInter.net. Um, I'm turn this down. So and I'm gonna start. My homepage is actually all the images are randomized each time, so they're in this position right now when you see it. Um, but if you visit it in your browser right now, they're probably in a different position. The window I have up here is my personal website, Maya on the Inter. Okay. Some windows Maya on the Inter. Net. Um, and I'm gonna start opening some windows. Um placing them around the screen. Uh, this one is glance back. Um, <laughs> it's a browser extension, uh, takes a photo of me once a day at random. Um, I, th I think you can tell that maybe it was hard to see, but because I just opened a new tab when I was showing that, that is the default, like this is the default new tab that I see every tab that I open. So I'm always, I always have those photos up and I think it's really jarring at first. Maybe you thought it was jarring. If you if you open a new tab and you just see all of these very candid photo, very intimate photos of myself, um, people definitely think it's kind of weird sometimes. 
uh, when I'm just out in public using my computer, someone's looking at my screen and I open it and it's just all these photos of me. Um, but that is my new tab homepage kind of, all yeah. the time. I kind of at first thought I would cleanse the photos before I did this presentation, but these yeah, I just was in Miami this today. past yeah, week. Today. And so okay. you can see me on the plane. There's one, the dark one is when I'm in the back of an Uber actually. And I was working on something. I, don't, I can't even remember what I was working on, but the lighting is so terrible. Um, kind of throws off the look of the whole class back then. I did this past year. Um, okay, so this project, fake it till you make it. Lol, is just the web site that is kind of the documentation of the project. What you're seeing when I'm going down to the Instagram page is the um, actual live running. It's like an iframe live running the algorithm that generates the output for this project but it's based on the instagram graphics that you see uh like i think they're more popular kind of 2018 2019 2020 but that are super feminine colors bubbly font often say something like love yourself um or believe in yourself that kind of energy um I got really into those these past couple of years um, and started saving so many of them um, and built a generative system to basically output phrases that were remixing language that I'd found on the Instagram. So like business is a liar is one of uh, one of the output. It's running live, so I don't know what's actually gonna come out there. Um, some of them are animated, like pleasures one there. Um, but this is just meant to run and show potential output for the algorithm. Um, okay. Something very um, soothing about collaging windows on the screen. It's what I'm always doing because I feel like I have a million tabs open all the time. Um, so this feels like sort of a natural way of working. Um, if I pull a window up, though, I kind of like to refresh it the movements um, okay yeah sure so this piece read it and weep you could also visit this it's out on the website read it and weep.live um but basically this the read it and weep piece is remixing text from three different places from journals that i've had over the years um so art and that's and that's what's in white um so like right there, it's like a dark cloud that doesn't want me to see through it. Um, that's from some journal entry that I've had since middle school, high school, or more recently. Then the hot pink text, let's see, let it run a little bit. Um, the hot pink text are excerpts from articles, books, and essays. Um, uh, so this one, one sense of individuality becomes more and more based on the source of media one consumes. So that has an underline under it. And so you can, if you actually visit this in your browser and you see the hot pink text with the underline, it's actually a link and it'll link out to the source of that text. Um, so that is what starting with my that is. That is. Um, it's so nice to see it in the browser because usually it's in a, like if I show it in a gallery setting, it's on a TV or something. And there's so many variables with having someone be able to kind of click on the live running code in the gallery. Um, and so it's nice to see it in the browser because I know that if you're looking at it, you can actually kind of open the links in a new tab, interact with it, refresh, refresh, see it rerun. Um, and that to me is sort of how it's meant to be viewed. Um, it's, it's like true home. And that's true for all of these, like they're all running live code. Um, and so the way that I like to see them displayed is knowing that it's it's via computer connected to a browser they're not videos they're not documentation of the work seeing the the code execute in the browser in this way is seeing the work live itself um and so this in this way it's like it's like a live performance in a lot of ways is how i think about the code actually type in a url yeah talking about typing no one types in urls anymore except i type gm to go to gmail sometimes so that's kind of true. Um, this piece, Shift Reality Instantly, very powerful. Um, this The site that you're seeing me go from is FX Hash. Um, it's a site for generative NFT um, 
NFTs on Tezos blockchain. Um, and I'm just, I open, I released the project on there, um, but you can open the live code via that, but you can see like these are, so it's a generative piece. So all of the things I'm scrolling through right here are different outputs. So there's different color options, um, but then I'm just opening a single one. And then that's what you see here. Also in this, so when I'm opening the window here, uh, you can see for a second, there are these words that appear off the side of the screen. And this was kind of like an Easter egg that I hid that no one has actually talked to me about. I don't know if anyone has noticed, but when it's when it's responding before it sort of remaps to take up the, the full screen, um, it, it exposes some words that would otherwise be hidden behind. Um, and Shift Reality instantly, very powerful, um, really was me drawing on the culture of uh, people watching subliminals, which I don't, if you haven't heard of a subliminal, it's like a YouTube video or some kind of video where they're like people whispering like embedded affirmations underneath an audio with the hope that like those affirmations will bring you improvement in your life. So wait, I'm gonna go back to this. So these are some of those affirmations. Um, these are talking about reality shifting. So like shifting from the, this reality that you're used to being into that you're, um, some people call it DR, like desired reality. This is, and this really relates to the way that I feel everyone uses the internet. Everyone's trying to craft their desired reality online. And so I just love that. Often these videos use these symbols. So that's my cursor moving. They use these symbols um, and these symbols sort of convey I are used from what I see as to convey like this magical power via text, like this magical power of the video. I was um, very vulnerable about seeing um, seeing someone else's social media, even just the UI around it, knowing that they're logged into their own. Account. So this is when I was posted on the Instagram. Instagram. Basic. I was I was a little concerned that it, immediately I was going to open that and it was going to feel annoying but this was really interesting to me because having the opportunity to say something in the caption about my work relating to Instagram on the Instagram Instagram was just like really meta for me to have the chance to uh it's like having the chance to inject something into that platform in that way was so interesting to me so that's what that is um I think I yeah I scroll down on the caption a little bit um but it's just really strange seeing yeah my face next to the Instagram Instagram time okay so see now I'm opening a new tab because I want to pull up a website so I can't link out to it there's glance back again um okay then I'm actually typing in this url uh everything I do is wrong everything I do is real that's the title of this piece, .fyi is the URL. Um, so this piece I made after Read It and Weep uh, and Read It and Weep is the one in the bottom right corner. And I wanted to continue to play around with um, this this format of the, the typing out and deleting. I have, a I think a lot about how to hold people's attention when they're looking at something text-based and especially something running in a browser also people's attention spans are so short to view something in a browser mine included so um I think this process of typing out letting a piece evolve slowly um with this tactic of layering the words over top of each other um it feels nice um and kind of gets at the the pacing that I'm hoping for in a work like this. Um, but unlike the read and weep, this text is super simple. Um, you can probably tell by looking at it, but it's repetitive. And I mean, it's randomly repetitive, but it's repetitive in certain ways. Um, There's actually, did I? Oh yeah. You can see for a second, I opened the console. Yeah, here. It's kind of nice. So I, I always put things in the console which is like the developer tools um, of a website. I'm always putting things in there. Um, there's a generative like log in there um, and some links, but I don't, that's what I love about doing code, like, like coding. There's actually one more. My work is that I'm able to build in 
layers manually into the piece. Um, so I always hope that the people who are interested in code uh, will dive a layer beneath the surface, which is the website. They'll actually dive into maybe the console and get or look at the source code and view, get something out of it that someone who's only accessing the top layer can do that. Online, so you could go to your browser and visit any of these URLs and see them running live. But this one- I kind of look distracted. This one is not yet online. This is my terminal. I have a little, my terminal prompt is a little I keep all of my pink heart. Um, which I like, but I also like keeping this like hacker colorway. Um, the combination of the terminal prompt and the, that colorway really feels like perfect for what I want. Um, so I wanted to show this last piece that I haven't put online yet because it's not finished, but I think it it rounds out the collage nicely. Um, so I'm just running a local server with that command right there, the Python command. I learned that in 2015 and now I use it all the time. It's my way to run a local server. So any any developers making a website is running it locally first before they put it online so anyone can access it. So this is kind of how I'm doing it. It's running at port 8,000, 8,000 is the default for this server. Um, and okay, yeah, there you can see. It. So I copy and pasted thousands of text messages from my current phone that all contain my name in them. Um, and then I'm rendering them in this way. It's, it's the window's so small because I want you to see the other windows, but, um, so hard to make them all visible at once. It is hard to make them all visible. It, yeah, there's a lot going on on here. Like my own personal version of Times Square. My work. <laughs> it's funny. I can read the text messages and tell exactly who wrote them um like there's a lot of my mom there's a lot of my friend Sophie it's also how people text some people use your name a lot I think this is everything um I hope you can see this this is a lot to look at it's a lot to take in at once I'm gonna close okay here's where I'm getting um I'm getting nervous about ending this section in this video this is it um Thank you all for watching so, me build this collage. I'm going to save your eyes. Okay, what I do love about seeing them all run at once, because I mean, I think any artist could put a collage of their work on screen like this and, and it would look amazing and you would find connections between them. But what I love about collaging the windows in this way is you're seeing the live code executing which I've talked about, but it's, it's just the, it's like, it's just the only way that you can see it. You're not seeing document, you're not seeing, seeing photos of the work or videos of the work. You're seeing the work itself running live in the browser. Um, and that's, what's so special to me about working in this way. Um, because it's, I'm able to just send a URL to someone else. You could make essentially this right now on your computer by visiting the same URLs that I went to and you are looking at the work. Um, For a second and stop screen recording. Um, so it's a little bit chaotic, so one second. I usually talk about when I'm thinking about stuff like this, I often talk about um, your presence online feeling like this distributed avatar. Um, and this to me feels like the distributed avatar where there are these discrete windows each with a work inside of them, um, true to form. Okay, that was it. I mean, I hope that makes sense. Um, I think it's nice to see all of the work that way, but um, yeah. I really appreciate you all watching and coming with me on the journey through all of my work in that way. There's a lot more to say, I feel, but um, I'll definitely talk about it more in the future. Um, yeah, so thank you all for watching. Um, if you have any questions,
questions at this point, you can drop them all in the chat. Um, yeah. And like and subscribe, subscribe. Thanks. Okay. On that note, I'm going to move in to the last part of this session. Well, my my last of the three parts. Then there's Q. Okay. Um. So. I'm going to move into a more traditional format. Um, this is uh, putting yourself on the screen. Thanks for being here. Um, when I was first making this presentation, I was tweeting about why every font choice for slides presentation is embarrassing. And my friend told me to use Comic Sans. So I want to preface that that's why I'm using Comic Sans um, in this presentation. But I want to talk about First, I want to just start by talking about the concept of being yourself. Um, this is something that advice that I got today when I told people I was nervous about this presentation. Um, people said, oh, just be yourself. And I've always found that type of advice so haunting um, because every time someone, throughout my entire life, every single time someone has told me to just be myself, I've always been been so confused by what they mean because I think about the concept of myself and I don't understand exactly who that is and it's always felt like some person that I'm meant to discover um, but I've always wondered is does everyone else feel like they just have access to this true self um, and where is that true self and how can I find her um, for me Ever since I was very young, my sense of self was always mediated by a computer screen. I, from super young age, was very into photo booth, which we were just using. Um, the effects on photo booth, I had a flip video camera. I used to make videos all the time of myself, of my friends. Um, and I was really constantly trying to understand who I was by putting myself on screen and filtering myself through these different um, through these different methods um, uh, through these different softwares, so I, from a very early age, was doing that, and at the same time, um, I was also a dancer, and so I grew up sort of in the um, competition dance scene in the U.S. Um, and it was always an exercise of going into the studio all the time. I really, really loved it, but I was always standing in front of these mirrors and trying to understand how to uh, render myself on stage in a way that was appealing to audiences. Um, so the combination of this dance education and dance experience, plus always being interested in not just representing, but manipulating reality, on screen with via software really shaped my interests um, now in the way that I see my art practice um, today. And so uh, I really think a lot about, I mean, the sort of classic John Berger ways of seeing um, this quote where he says, he's taught, it's the chapter where he's talking about the representation of women in art throughout history. And he, he says a woman must continually watch herself. She's almost continually accompanied by her own image of herself. And I remember reading that and being really uh, both surprised and unsurprised by it. Surprised someone had, surprised to hear it articulated, but unsurprised because it's how I've really felt all the time. Like I'm constantly trying to see myself from this uh, third person point of view and be able to do that so I can judge myself. Um, and Quen Blackwell in the D'Amalio show, which the D'Amalio family, Charlie D'Amalio, Dixie, um, they're like famous TikTokers and they have this reality TV show. And in the first season, one of their friends says this um, on screen. And she comments saying that the, it's this third person that's not existed in any other generation. It's in your head all the time. And she's really talking about social media, but this 
this phenomenon relates a lot to uh, what John Berger was saying, um, that there's this, there's this third person, there's this exercise of always trying to watch yourself um, that's exacerbated by being online. Um, and I initially got on Instagram around 2012, and I've been on Instagram for 10 years. Um, and so I've had this constant uh, relationship with posting online where I've, I've often posted a lot and it's felt really natural to me in a lot of ways because I've, I'm used to performance. I'm used to manipulating my image on screen. And so using Instagram as an extension of that has always come really naturally to me, but I always have felt plagued by this question, uh, uh, plagued by a sense of guilt because I've always wondered, okay, everyone seems to be saying that the right way to post online is to be realistic, to be authentic. Um, and I always felt really guilty about feeling like what I was posting was fake in some way. Um, and the way that we talk about posting on the internet is, is often through this lens of authenticity, where we see someone being authentic online, like often a celebrity. I mean, really anyone, we often say, okay, if they're being authentic, then they're being good. They're being like a good person online. If they're being fake in a way that's detectable, uh, they're being, um, they're, they're bad. We don't like them. And so this question of authenticity, we're always kind of measuring people against, um, some elusive threshold of authenticity online. Um, and I was been thinking about this for a long time. And the first project that I, um, really put out after I graduated college, um, is this project called Glance Back. Um, and I talked about it a little bit before, but it's a, it's a browser extension that once a day takes a photo of you at random and asks you what you're thinking about. This is the website. Um, this is what it looks like when it takes a photo of you. Um, and so it says, what are you thinking about? Takes the photo. And then you on that line type a caption to say whatever it is that you're thinking about in that moment. Um, and then you do that every day and you start to collect this archive of photos of you, no expression on your face, just thinking about whatever you're thinking about while you're on your computer. Um, so I've been using it since the beginning of 2019 and I now have over a thousand photos. Um, and it's become this really meaningful collection for me of moments that I wouldn't otherwise have documented of me staring at my computer. Um, but one of the most surprising things about it is I just made it for myself really at first because it was my personal obsession was to have this type of documentation. Um, but people saw that I was using it and were interested in using it. So I ended up releasing it publicly. Um, and so now this browser extension, anyone can add on currently on Chrome, um, it has about 8,000 users. Um, so here, I can't see anyone's photos, but if people share them online, I tag me, I can see them. So these are examples of other people using the extension. Um, and it's been really meaningful to see other people develop a relationship with a piece of software that I wrote for myself that now lives on their machines, um, especially because I initially conceptualize it as something closer to a journal than a form of social media. Um, here's some of my glance backs. Um, I was blonde last year, so that's where these are coming from. <laughs> um, and this is what it looks like in the new tab page. Um, but what I really found was over time, it, this really was meaningful to me as an archive. Uh, but still, even though I wanted, the, the, the camera goes off randomly, you don't have time to prepare for it. Um, I still, it didn't quite feel like authenticity in the way I imagined authenticity would feel in terms of self-representation. Um, and I think my friend Terry wrote this piece comparing Glance Back um, to uh, Be Real, which is a really popular app now, at least in my community, that it's on your phone and once a day at random, it sends you a notification to take a photo and then you post the photo and then takes it from your front and back camera. All your friends can see it on a feed, but it's sort of it's sort of marketed as an antidote to Instagram or more performative social media. I mean, it's called Be Real, but um, yeah, there's obviously an element of performance that goes into it um, because it's a social media feed and everyone's thinking about 
other people seeing their photos. And so in this comparison, Terry talks about Glansback also saying, even under Glansback's unexpected voyeurism, what it captured didn't feel any more or less authentic than be real self-directed gaze. And I really felt that because um, after making Glance Back, and I kind of had this idealistic idea of how it would feel to use a piece of software like this, and um, it didn't feel authentic, it didn't feel real, it just felt like another side of um, self-documentation, um, not necessarily uh, more real or um, true in an objective sense uh, than, you know, like my Instagram profile. Um, and so around the time when I was making Glance Back, I started getting really interested in thinking about um, that feeling of performance that I was only beginning to recognize was something that I felt really heavily all of the time. Um, and so I thought a lot about this idea of the presentation of self in everyday life, um, which is the title of a book by Irving Goffman, a sociologist. Um, and it came out in about 1958, um, way pre internet. But um, in this, book Goffman is talking about the self as um he has this like dramaturgical theory of the self and so he says the self then as a performed character is a dramatic effect arising diffusely from a scene that is presented so really he's saying that the self rather than it being this innate um true core of you instead it's this this uh performed character that arises um depending on the context you're in, it, it comes about in different ways. So thinking about that framework, I started thinking a lot about the presentation of self in everyday life online. What does it mean to apply that method of thinking to the way that we're interacting now all the time on the internet? And um, Jenny O'Dell um, writes about this really nicely, um, talking about the concept of context collapse in her book, How to Do Nothing. Because you think about if you are, if I'm hanging out with my closest friends uh, versus my professors versus my grandparents um, versus this talk right now. I'm super different in all of those situations with those different people, but all of those people, some of them definitely follow me um, on the internet. And so online, you, I kind of have to become this more singular version of myself that's palatable to all of those audiences. Um, or at least keep that in mind with what I'm posting. And so Jenny O'Dell writes about how online your audience includes close friends, family, potential employers, coworkers, even enemies. So all of these people um, that you're different with when you're with them one-on-one, -on -one, suddenly they're all making up your audience when you're online. And so I've described my relationship with the internet for a long time as a love-hate relationship. And that's the title of this piece, um, which... Uh, Doc, a photo of the piece is on the left. Um, the video on the right is um, the video that is playing on the phone that's sitting in the front pocket of the punching bag. Um, but I've always felt my relationship was with the internet was one of love hate because I love posting online. And in many ways, it feels very natural because I've always had this sense of performance in a lot of aspects of my life. But at the same time, I feel really complicated about it and um, hate myself for it almost because it, it feels um, manipulated uh, given the platforms that I'm posting on. It, and I've always worried that it feels fake in some way um, and performative. And, and that for a while was attached, um, that concept was linked to uh, guilt and shame in a lot of ways. And so um, I started thinking back to when I began this process of media production and consumption and be started to become aware of the way that that was shaping my identity so seriously. Um, and so I started thinking back to me in this era. This is my room in 2011. I grew up in central Pennsylvania in a small town. Um, and I was really would spend before I was on the internet, I was really into uh, reading magazines. That was kind of my access to culture at that point in my life. Um, I would read a lot of magazines like this that were uh, 17 um, headlines like pretty looks for you. Get your best butt. Is school secretly making you fat? Um, I would worship these like a religious text almost because I growing up I was constantly looking for how to perform 
femininity and perform a grow out of girlhood into an adult in in what I wanted to feel was the right way and I didn't I was the oldest of sibling I was the oldest of all my cousins and everything and I felt like I was really looking for someone to just tell me how to be and so I read these not as entertainment but as instructions almost and so I started thinking a lot about um the way that I use the internet now and the way that uh the internet now has this feedback loop where you can put you can consume content online but at the same time you can post content online um but when I was reading these magazines I was really purely in this process of consumption uh and and just taking it all in versus having a an avenue to reproduce myself in this exact way. Um, but recently, I've been thinking a lot about my relationship to this type of media. Um, and so for a the solo show I had uh, for my MFA program this past spring, um, I made the poster in the style of one of these uh, 17 magazines. Um, and I'm really, I became really fascinated by the tone that exists in the way that they write these headlines it, it obviously is meant to stick in your mind it's meant to be super dramatic um and I really uh enjoyed mimicking that tone with the way that I was writing these uh headlines that were references to the work in my uh last show so for example um Maya Mann what she really thinks about the internet revealed uh the trick to intersecting art and technology he'll love this move um ways you're already performing yourself online plus software live in the browser um and so i i really enjoy taking on this tone and taking the tone and twisting it in some way to make it work in service of the ideas that i want to talk about um and then this show actually went to tokyo this past summer um and was shown at the new gallery soot um, and so I made a Japanese version of the poster um, that was based on the Japanese 17 magazine, which I think it's just a different company completely, um, but has the same name. Um, but graphically, the, st the style of the cover is uh, very different. And it was interesting getting into designing this cover versus this cover. Um, but interestingly, we're working with the curator. Um, she helped me translate a lot of actual 17 Japanese magazine covers. And they're talking about the same things. They're talking about looking hot, being skinny, getting a boy to like you. Um, and it's very transcends culture. Um, but the the show that I, this was the show in LA, um, I had at UCLA. So you can see um, Read It and Weep, which I showed earlier is um, there on the TV. And then the um, Love Hate piece is hanging there. Um, and so I started thinking a lot after going through the process of thinking about Seventeen Magazine, putting myself back into the bedroom that I spent time in reading those magazines, where, where did this sense of wanting to be myself come from? Where did I feel like I was reading these instructions that told me that was what I was supposed to be doing? Um, and so then I started thinking a lot, of getting very into um, these types of Instagram graphics. Uh, and these graphics are always, um, you've probably maybe seen them online, um, but um, I mentioned them before a little bit, but I, I got really into looking at these that these, gra these text-based graphics on a, such a visual platform like Instagram, the way that text operates most successfully um, is via the, this sort of rendering. Um, and the the aesthetics of it um are meant to really catch your eye as you're scrolling meant to make you stop double tap and they're they're often about um the what what the text is saying is often about self-confidence or wellness um making your life better essentially uh and i started saving truly hundreds of these i made a new instagram account and i trained the algorithm that uh, I had on that Instagram account to basically only it quickly learned that I only wanted to do graphics like this. So I started collecting hundreds of these graphics and saving them um, and analyzing what it was about what it was about this genre that tied all of the this all of these types of uh, content together. Um, 
And there's this video by Vox uh, talking about this style of graphic on Instagram. And in it, they say there's a certain color palette, kind of font and design. Actually, they're talking, this video is talking about how QAnon used those styles to uh, onboard people, especially targeting women, um, to QAnon, which is was a whole nother layer of fascinating to me because the 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 graphics have a very uh religious undertone to them to me um and they also really rely on this type of um aesthetic tactic that I saw used by a lot of direct to consumer brands over the past couple of years like Glossier, Away, Buffy um but what was really what really drew me to the graphics was that they're using this type of style but rather than selling a product they're they're trying to sell both an account the account that's posting them but also an idea rather than a product um so i started prototyping um and developing a system that would allow me to uh gener generate graphic backgrounds that were in this style but also text um generate i wanted to be able to generate language that felt like it was in the style and tone of these graphics um, but kind of walk the line between sometimes sounding normal, like a, a graphic you would see all the way to sounding totally absurd. Um, so that's how this project fake it till you make it came about. Um, uh, and it's a generative project. Um, and I wrote about it here that it borrows from the bubbly language and pastel aesthetics of text driven Instagram graphics to scrutinize the promotion of wellness, self-care and confidence on social media online. These types of posts survive on likes, comments, and shares. What do I believe becomes what do I want to appear to believe? Think until you make it. Maybe your dream life lives here in a digital fantasy world where the algorithm plays God and loving yourself feels like looking into the light of your screen. Um, so with these, uh, the way that I built the algorithm that um, generates these graphics uh, was by actually taking phrases, words and phrases from the collection that I had of actual graphics uh, and then putting them into different arrays in the code, essentially. So if I saw one that said, believe in yourself, I'd put believe in my verb list, then it'd be verb in yourself as a sentence structure. And there's a there's 250 phrase structures and lots of nouns, adjectives, adverbs, and more. Um, so total, all that together, there's over 80 billion possible phrases that can be generated. Um, and here are some examples of the um, output that generated. Um, <laughs> so as you can probably tell a lot of the language there, I really wanted the, the feeling of the language, the feeling of the graphic to retain the feeling, um, both aesthetically and tone wise of the original source content. Um, but I wanted something to sound a little bit off usually, um, when you were reading the ones that were generated. Uh, and so that algorithm that has this, the structure of remixing and almost like a Mad Lib system worked really well for what I wanted. Um, so it's not machine learning. Um, I think some people see that it's generated and think it's machine learning. Um, but it's, it's, um, yeah, a more controlled algorithmic tactic that I used to generate these. Um, and these, this project released on this platform called Artblocks, I'll go ahead here to show you just what it looks like. Um, and it released in an edition of 700 and it was in the crypto world. And so I was really curious to see how people would react, um, especially collectors who were in this space who were kind of, um, you know, not accustomed to a project that looked like this. So I really love this quote by someone that wrote in the discord after, um, I saw the project and they said, absolutely hated it to my core for the first 30 seconds after seeing it, then flipped to loving it within 10 minutes. One of the biggest emotional reactions I've had to a project, TBH. Um, and also in the Discord, uh, people started using, calling the uh, graphics as responses to other people's, like using it in conversation, which was something really interesting that I didn't anticipate. Um, so this one, anybody got some good weekend plans? And then Aaron pulled up Carmen into my full project. 
So here's what some of the outputs look on the art blocks page. Um, so I like seeing them seeing them there, and, and I really wanted to think about the outputs not only as individuals but also as full collections. Um, and I also wanted then to think about how to put uh, these graphics back in sort of their, their uh, original ecosystem, which is Instagram. So I also have an Instagram account. This is the handle fake until you make it LOL, um, where I like post them every, I'm doing it manually. So I kind of post them whenever I feel like it. Uh, but it's very nice to see them circulate and see people react to them one by one on the Instagram account. Um, but when I started making this project, I was kind of cynical about those graphics that I used to see before because they felt like very um, sort of reductive methods of belief system signaling um, that didn't get didn't get past like a double tap, keep scrolling kind of interaction. But after generating so many of them and seeing, honestly, sometimes a uh, one that's generated that I that really resonates with me, I've kind of wondered why I felt so frustrated with them before. Uh, because honestly, if, if one of them brings a person meaning, then that's truly meaningful. And I think is fine. I and I I started just trying to unpack why I was felt so negatively toward them. Um, and I was thinking a lot about that while in conjunction with this idea of authenticity that I think I felt that the graphics weren't, you know, an authentic representation of what a person believed necessarily. Um, and in this piece by Toby Shoren, um, this essay after authenticity, he talks about kind of going through a a similar journey in some ways um, and ending up realizing that there's this deep entitlement to this idea of an, an authentic self. So this idea that it, a true authentic self is something that you can achieve is, is kind of this entitled idea. Like you, you feel like, oh, if I'm being more authentic than this person I see online, I'm better than them in some way. I've achieved, uh, achieved something more in terms of my, um, cognitive ability to be self-aware and react and in, interact with the real. Um, and I've really adopted in, instead personally in the way I interact with the internet, um, just a, a, a belief system in which I don't subscribe to the possibility of authenticity on the internet. So rather than putting myself on screen, I think about uh, performing myself on screen. Um, and this is what I talk about a little bit in um, the Instagram post that was posted on the Instagram Instagram. Um, in the caption, I was really specific about I wanted what I wanted them to write. Um, and I say in a quote on Instagram, everyone's performing with their personal profile. That's not to say what happens here isn't meaningful, powerful, or real, but I mean that we're always posting with an audience in mind. I make artwork about that experience of performing myself on the internet because it's always felt both beautiful and absurd. I dream that people find my work and use it as a tool to contemplate their own relationship to the way they present themselves online. Um, and uh, the writer, Biz Sherbert, talks about this in her essay, God Posting or New Internet Esotericism, um, talking about how outsiders and onlookers are always trying to figure out if uh, specifically this like God Posting trad cast trend of people uh, like, perf uh, like performing being Catholic online. That's what she's talking about, but this applies in a larger sense. Um, just people are always trying to figure out if all of this is ironic, stylistic, or sincere. It doesn't really matter what it is. It just matters that people keep guessing. And I think what's exciting about this moment online is that um, I, I like the, the trend toward allowance for um, ambiguity. I guess it's not really a trend. It's more of a hope of mine because things feel like they're operating in extreme absolutes. Um, and I think that's it's very it makes it difficult for anybody to do anything. Uh, so rather than this idea of fearless authenticity that often seems to be promoted online, instead, as my computer once generated, uh, I'm say you were online and you deserve a right life. So thank you. That is all I have to say. Um, that's my website and my Instagram, and my Twitter. Yes, I'm sharing. Thanks, Maya. 
we already have a couple of questions in the Q and A and uh, the chat, uh, but selfishly, I'm gonna jump in ahead of the line. Uh, uh, and yeah, th thanks again for all three of these uh, segments. Uh, and to me, I guess I just wanted to ask uh, each of these really three distinct but related presentations. Uh, you know, the initial uh, collage or self-portrait on screen, the reaction video, and uh, the more lecture style uh, presentation. Uh, again, related to one another, but distinct in the, their own right. Uh, so I was wondering if you could say a few words regarding the degree of performativity that exists within each of these presentations, uh, specifically thinking about the idea of deliberate performativity within something like a reaction video, which is drawing on existing tropes uh, within social media formats versus the you know, perhaps subconscious, but uh, I'm thinking maybe not uh, performativity of an artist talk or academic lecture. Yeah, totally. Um, so I'm really fascinated by the genre of reaction videos because they require this inherent, by nature, they require the, the person watching the video to perform perform watching the video um, in a way that's really externalized and exaggerated. Um, and um, I wanted to kind of bring that into the conversation around self-presentation because the whenever I'm watching myself do anything back, like seeing a recording, seeing my looking at my Instagram profile from the past years, um, I'm always having this Kind of intense reaction where I'm judging myself. I'm thinking about why I did this or that, um, and and having the opportunity to externalize it in a reaction video, um, kind of forced me to perform that uh, internal process that I go through all of the time, um, and that's really what. And I, I think there's something people love about seeing someone externalize their reaction to a piece of content that they can simultaneously watch in some way. Um, it's almost really, it's almost validating in a way to know that someone else shares the emotions or or interesting to see someone have conflicting emotions. Um, so performing that to me was challenging in the way that I was trying to um, mimic the form while also be true to uh the way that I constant inside of my mind that I'm constantly always monitoring myself um and in this format the reaction video feels more like the unusual performance because you know it's a Singapore art museum and the format that feels more natural for this context is the artist talk um but in reality the 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 sort of more casual nature that a person um, takes on in a reaction video um, compared to an artist talk, I think uh, some people would argue is less performative even, even than an art, or it's, it's meant to be seen as less performative because in an art, artist talk, you're meant to watch the artist sort of put on the artist's identity and then reaction video, um, a lot of them kind of thrive on the ability to feel relatable more. Um, that was a lot. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of many right. layers of, uh, of performance. Many layers, yeah. Um, so I have some more questions, but maybe I'll turn because uh, I also want to ask about glance back. So I'm looking at one of the, the audience questions uh, from Angela. Uh, Hi, Maya, huge fan of glance back. When I was using it, I found that it captured some vulnerable moments of mine. I was wondering if anybody expressed any concern over privacy when you were making the browser extension. Oh yeah, I mean, really? So I always say, when I talk about it, I always say the photos are stored locally, which basically means that they're not being sent to a server anywhere. So if, if you have it on your machine, the photos truly never leave your machine. So I don't have access to them. No one can have access to them because they're only on your computer. Um, and so I always talk about that, but I, over the past year, have posted um, a couple TikToks about the extension that have gotten a lot of views and people who 
just have, are seeing it totally out of context. And, you know, some people comment and they're excited about it. Um, and they're like, I'm going to install this right now. And then there's this other whole thread of comments all the time that people are like, you are so dumb. This is obviously spyware. Don't, don't install it. It's so dangerous. And then sometimes someone else will come and be like, oh, I looked at the code and it's all stored locally and it's fine or whatever. But um, yeah, I think the default reaction is to be suspicious in some way from a lot of people because it's obviously strange that the extension turns on your webcam and takes a photo of you. Um, so there's definitely privacy concerns um, that ha people have told me around it. But yeah, I always try to emphasize that all the photos are local. And like, if you wanted to, the codes on your computers, you could go into the code and confirm that. Um, yeah. Have you, have you gotten any glance back spoofs uh, that that claim to be the same browser extension, but maybe you're no not, not that oh popular yet. Okay. That's a scary <laughs> thought. <laughs> I haven't, but yeah, I've gotten a lot of uh well, one thing I've gotten is people sometimes lose their photos because whatever, if like if your computer's gone, the photos are gone because they're only on your computer. So I'm trying to think about how I can figure out a way to back them up in a way that people still feel safe about. Because if to back them up, um, like maybe put them on a drive or Google Drive or something, I don't know. But yeah, it's a uh, delicate balance. Yeah, I mean, I also had a question about glance back, uh, specifically how self-performance functions in a project like glance back. And uh, if there are any other glance back users uh, in the audience, uh, feel free to answer this question also, not just for Maya. Um, but yeah, how, how the idea of self-performance functions when the audience uh, is not necessarily a public audience like social media, but is potentially uh, just a future version of yourself uh, or, you know, uh, of the user. Uh, yeah. And whether these types of self-performance uh, function differently or if it's just more of a, a scale of degree. Totally. I mean, so glance back intentionally, there's no social component, like everyone who has it can't see each other's photos either. Um, so really, it's designed for you as the person using it to be your own, the, the audience. It's just you. Um, but I've found using it that I'm always thinking about like when it prompts me what to type. There are a few things that come up for me. One is it's become such a valuable archive to me that often I'm thinking about what does the future me want to remember about today? What does future me want to remember about this moment? Um, and so I'm often thinking about how to type something in that future me as an audience will value, um, which is sort of like a strange way to think about altering actions um, for like your future self as the audience for seeing this archive um so that's one unexpected way i found that i start to use it when i see it um and also the other the other way is that like you always want to have a kind of idea of who you're who you are that you think is cool and so um there's also this tendency to, for me to want to write something in i mean sometimes i share the photos online so other people will see them and i'm like oh i want them to think I was thinking of, you know, whatever I am thinking about, but like, you know, I think someone else was here, but even for myself, I noticed sometimes there are moments where I'm like, oh, like this, I, this song or whatever. Like, I think this is, I, I can just, I can kind of watch myself do the exercise a little bit. And that's interesting to me because even when I'm doing it for myself, I have a ten, like, I have a tendency to want to view myself in a certain way. Um, so there, there's a, there's a kind of more about writing it, the captions, but I do think like even in a social media for one kind of situation, like glance back, um, yeah, it, it always still exists. Um, and it's not bad. It's just there. So um, yeah, that's kind of how I think about it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think uh, your answer started to get at one of these other questions we got in the Q&A when you mentioned, uh, you know, the 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 song background so uh the uh, aptly named uh anonymous attendee uh asks uh what do you think is the relationship between the music we choose to listen to and the identities we present i often find myself tagging photos i post 
to my Instagram story with the most niche or unique songs in my library to appeal to this idea about individuality and presenting that to my audience. Yeah, totally. Um, it's so, yeah, it's, it's funny to see you recognize that uh, desire to do that. Also, this just makes me totally think of Spotify wrapped, um, which like on my social media feeds was being posted all of the time lately. Um, and it, it's, if you're not familiar with it, it's like Spotify's uh, like end of year analysis of everything that you listen to. And tons of um, people share their top songs or top artists. Um, and I think there's some, there's some pride and the conversation around it is like, there's kind of some pride in listening to more specialized or more unique artists. Um, and some shame with listening to things that are really popular. Like I'll see TikToks that are like, I, I want to share, I can't share mine because it was just like Harry Styles and Taylor Swift or whatever. Um, and so, um, I, I mean, so much on social media, we want to feel like as an individual, we can differentiate and feel special in some way online. And it's very, it's very humbling um, and kind of counter to how we want to feel to 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 know that we're sort of in the majority in some way um, and so I think like that that desire is just about self-definition and about aligning yourself with um, the identity of maybe these like more niche musicians who are popular and or maybe who are like popular in smaller communities or kind of letting people know that you align with this thing that is more specialized. Um, it's like self design. Um, but I do think it's interesting because with the Spotify wrapped thing, like now I, I think about it every time I get my Spotify wrapped because I love pop music. I listen to a lot of really basic stuff and I'm like, wow, should I start listening to like cooler like it, it kind of the like like sharing what you listen to process affects then what I choose to listen to in some ways too which no one needs to know what I listen to it, it could be a totally private thing um yeah but I think it's just part of the like identity building scheme <laughs> um yeah awesome uh and uh yeah, uh, just a little bit of, to recap a little bit of response on it. Uh, Angela said, thanks for answering my question. I personally had no concerns over privacy when using it, so kudos. Uh, I think it's very interesting that people tend to be more okay with submitting their data when it's packaged nicely for them, as is the case with Spotify wrapped, glance back, et cetera. Whereas mm -hmm. if it's tracking for contact tracing for COVID, uh, it becomes a little more controversial. Uh, and we have a few glance back users in the chat uh gabriel uh the, the randomized time of of it glance back has also changed how i think about opening tabs i often notice it took a picture when the green button goes off since i'm going so fast into another tab and the picture looks frantic uh so uh, actually influencing the way people use the uh use the browser uh it sounds like um yeah, so, uh, yeah, let me see, I guess a couple of other posts coming in. Um, yeah. Letitia asks, uh, I'm always thinking about the popularity of girl blogging, I think girl blogging, uh, which yeah. is like both informed by a cognizant nostalgia of the girlish consumption you mentioned, but also the gloat of being surveilled. How do you think performing femininity online has evolved with this seeming self-awareness? Yeah, I've been thinking about, well, yeah, I'm always thinking about that thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, specifically the genre of girl blogging, um, which I guess I would describe as, um, yeah, and they kind of described it in this way, like really embracing the uh, nostalgia of, um, I often associate it with kind of like tw 2010s uh, femininity, uh, like, pink bows and going to the mall and like um 
this podcast I listen to a lot has this episode called sugar cookie consumerism, which I think is like a really good phrase that they coined um, that I associate with the idea of girl blogging and kind of performing this like extreme girlishness. Um, I, there's this sort of allowance that I think our, our culture gives to the archetype of the young girl to feel things really deeply feel emotions really deeply and express emotions really deeply and dramatically um that's not really allowed that's not really that allowance isn't really granted to any other demographic like it's not granted to young boys um because if young boys are acting like that they're being girls um which is a bad a derogatory um and if you know a an, a woman who is meant to be an adult is acting dramatic um she's being too bossy or too bitchy or too or overly emotional um and, and and I mean those are things that could be said often about a young girl but a young girl but when we see it in media the young girl is often who is focused on as having this um who's allowed to have this really emotional um uh dramatic experience and so I think there's a nostalgia when I think about girl blogging it's a lot about the externalization of the the aesthetics of girlhood um and a, a lot of that I feel lies in this desire to have to uh claim that allowance um for emotions to be felt as deeply um as they can be when you are identifying with that archetype um I think that's where a lot of it comes from. Um, yeah, I can only read, uh, you know, the young girl grew uh, Tikkun, uh, in which yeah. case, you know, the, the young girl is not uh, defined by by gender or by age, uh, but becomes yeah. a, a classification outside of those things that's defined by the the tropes that you're you're uh, describing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, totally. I, and like that, that text has been so controversial, but I think what they do really nail is especially the concept of the young girl in relationship to consumerism and commodification. Um, and the young girls, like as a concept, is very targeted um, and marketed to um, in so many ways and also marketed. It's very natural. Um, for this idea of the young girl to be uh, almost like packaged and sold as a product in a lot of ways. And so um, seeing the way that femininity is performed online, like a lot of platforms kind of encourage you to commodify yourself in ways to that make you easily consumable um, to a public. And I think the performance of young girl is like a vehicle for that um, in ways that feel familiar. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that uh, that text is also very like uh, like it feels like uh, maybe uh, poster aesthetics. Uh, like I mean, like online posting, like uh, poster as mm -hmm. an identity uh, yeah, aesthetics yeah. Uh, before social media. Just like it, mm -hmm. it almost feels like it's meant to draw controversy uh, by repurposing existing content. So yeah, yeah. It's it's hard oh. to see like. What, what's deliberate or performative or inflammatory yeah. and what's sincere, yeah. Yeah, totally, um, yeah. So either the same or another anonymous attendee asks, uh, I know you experienced the bubbly Instagram graphic posts, uh, but I am also curious if you experienced the niche memes and starter packs that were going around for a brief time, I believe around 2018. I often experience these through sites like Pinterest. Um, oh yeah i mean the bubbly instagram graphics were one very specific genre of memes that i i mean i wouldn't really call those memes actually but like one specific genre of instagram post that i got really into uh investigating as a genre um yeah but the niche meme culture and like starter pack culture and then more recently the sort of like um the esoteric um uh like pseudo-religious meme culture too um 
yeah, I definitely <laughs> have been in many different phases of seeing those operate online. Um, but yeah, I, especially the starter, like, okay, thinking about the starter packs and a lot of like the more complex, like intentionally difficult to read memes that are popular now, um, both aesthetically and also in terms of like contextually, <laughs> um, I think there's like they are a way for people to signal to people in their community that um, they're sort of part of this same online world because on a play on any platform it's so open world um, that these these graphics by by liking them following these types of accounts and reposting them you can kind of signal that you're in with this specific aspect of culture um and then also like the starter packs there's so much about categorization which is which has just gone through so many different forms online like i think a lot about the sort of aesthetic wiki of like cottagecore um dark academia, whatever, like <laughs> ballet core. There's all these different genres of aesthetics people now like, like are interested in labeling in that way. Um, and I think that's kind of what the starter packs were doing uh, in a lot of ways too. It's what like the Buzzfeed quizzes were doing to an extent. It's what horoscopes do to an extent. Um, so <laughs> these, these constant cycles of trying to find ways to label ourselves. Um, always seems to um yeah find a new way to become popular online <laughs> yeah so i think we're sort of running up on time so i'll ask one more question and then maybe we can uh outro from there um I mean, we've been talking a lot about uh performativity in your work so i'm just wondering how you see uh, your own artistic practice in relation to other artists who have explored social media platforms as sites for performing different modes of identity, uh, whether it's sincere or parody. Uh, I mean, I'm thinking specifically of projects like Amalia Ullman's Instagram series, Excellences and Perfections, or Jason Newson's uh, YouTube videos, Art Thoughts with, with Hennessy Youngman, uh, but this might sit in a different realm. Yeah, totally. Um, it's really fascinating to me that there's this long history of media, like media artists, artists engaged with technology in some way that um, end up enacting some sort of performance in this way. Um, like I think about Lynn Hirschman Leeson, who did this performance as Roberta Brightmore um, pre-internet, where she would kind of act as this young single woman in San Francisco and walk around and she she like saw a psychiatrist as this person and would put on a lot of makeup and um, have people take photos of her uh, performing as this character in different situations. Um, and then I also think a lot about um, Anne Hirsch's Scandalicious Project, which was on YouTube, where she was performing as this um, young girl, Caroline, who would kind of dance for the camera, upload her videos, and then also talk to the camera often. Um, and yeah, and then also Molly Soda, who has put out so much work on YouTube where she's working with performance, but in this way that's intentionally ambiguous. Um, and the ambiguity is something that I that resonates with me a lot um, because for like in Amalia Ullman's piece, um, which I which I love, and the Hennessy Youngman performance. Both of those, both of those pieces are involved the creation of sort of a character really distinct from the artist, um, which I think made them very easily legible uh, to an art audience in a lot of ways. Um, but there's something uh, really beautiful about the complexity of performance when it is when there's a lot of ambiguity between uh in in trying to distinguish who's who's the artist and who's the character um and i think yeah and and hirsch did that well in her piece even though she used a different name she talks a lot about how like it really was an exaggerated part of exploring herself um and molly talks about that a lot in her performance work um and so i see the work that i do and i'm thinking about performance and talking about it it's all it's all me and it's still 
it's not coming from a place where I'm trying to be a different person. Um, but putting myself online does bring out these exaggerated aspects of my personality. And that's kind of what I'm interested in exploring and, and um, allowing to be complicated in certain ways. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, we did have one more question come in, uh, but I realized that uh, we're running up on time and you should probably go to sleep before the the sun comes up. So I would encourage <laughs> Uh, our most recent anonymous uh, attendee to uh, at Maya uh, when she uh, flashed her socials up. Uh, I'm sure we can can get a response. Uh, so yeah, just before we close out, I want to thank everyone one more time. Uh, Maya, everyone at Sam who who put Skill Skill Futures together, um, and encourage everyone to to join us for future. Uh, online programs, or if you're in Singapore, to to come visit us at uh, Tenjong Bagar District Park. Um, yeah, thanks again, Maya, and yeah. uh, thanks to everyone Thank who attended. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks everybody. That was really nice.